Introduction Part 2 It was comparatively at a late period in the world's history when Australia was opened up as a field for geographical research. But notwithstanding that the accumulated knowledge of centuries was thus brought to bear upon it, the characteristic and unique formation of the country set at naught all the approved deductions and theories of the scientific world. A paradox, or as a clever writer recently put it, a surviving fragment of the primitive world, with a nature contradictory and inconsistent, as compared even with itself, cut off from the rest of the globe and left to work out the problem of its existence alone. No wonder it was only after successive generations had toiled at it that Australia was, even in part, understood. The interior of Australia is, as is well known, an immense plain, having an average height of 1,500 to 2,000 feet with a decided tilt, or slope, towards the southwest. Round the foot of this tableland is a terrace of lower country varying greatly in width. The river systems of the coastal lands lying between the sea and the foot of the tableland were easily understood and traced. That of the interior was far more difficult. Starting from Cape York in the extreme north and following down the eastern coast, the edge of the tableland is formed of ranges, often of considerable height, the gullies and spurs of which were mostly clothed with scrub and jungle of tropical growth and luxuriance. Amongst the peaks of this range, there are Distant Peak, 3,573 feet, Peter Bott Mountain, 3,311 feet, Grey Peak, 3,357 feet, the Bellender Kerr Hills, 5,433 feet high. Further south, the level is more uniform. The isolated peak of Mount Elliot, which attains a height of 4,075 feet, forming the exception until further south again the elevations approach to 4,250 feet. An average height of a little over 2,000 feet is then maintained until the borderline of Queensland is reached and here in Mount Lindsay 5,500 feet is met with. The New England range maintains its altitude in many peaks including Mount Seaview from which point Oxley sighted the ocean 6,000 feet high. Still to the south, the mountains on the border of the plateau keep up an average of between three and 4,000 feet until, at the southeast extremity of our continent, the greatest height is attained in Mount Kosciuszko, falling some 700 feet short of the limit of perpetual snow, its elevation being 7,308 feet. To the westward, many of the peaks reach altitudes of over 5,000 and 6,000 feet, until the large depression is encountered through which the great body of interior waters find their way to the sea by means of the Murray Channel. West of this gap, the edge of the tableland is broken and depressed, the highest crests of the coastal range rarely reaching to 3,000 feet in height. And along the shoreline facing the Great Australian Bight, it is almost non-existent. On reaching the southwest corner of Australia, the elevated edge reforms in the Russell and Darling Ranges, and trending northward, skirting the coast, culminates in Mount Bruce, 4,000 feet above sea level. From hence, the range following the sea line is broken, rugged and precipitous, but of inconsiderable height, and when the centre of the Gulf of Carpentaria is reached, it falls away into highlands and slopes, joining the eastern ranges. On the Great Plateau, encircled by this range, no elevations of any moment are to be found. A kind of chain traverses the centre from north to south, but though in places presenting a bold formation, the highest altitude attained is in the McDonnell Ranges of 4,000 feet. From the coastal range, the edge of the tableland, flow the rivers that run direct to the sea on the seaward face. But in many instances, a false tableland occurs. The streams that drain which unite in forcing their way through deep gorges to the lowlands of the coast. This false tableland is conspicuous in the valley of the Upper Burdekin River on the east coast and on the headwaters of the Fitzroy. The country drained by the top tributaries of these rivers being only divided from the real tableland by a gentle ascent, whereas the descent to the coast is steep 
and abrupt. Most of the northern rivers, too, take their rise in a plateau that is almost on a level with the Great Plain, but cut their way down to the sea through gorges instead of being lost in the interior. It follows, then, that the drainage and character of the terrace surrounding the continent, keeping to natural and known laws, was at once understood, but the drainage of the plateau was more difficult to comprehend and it is now known to be confined to two river systems only. First, that of the Darling and Murray, which rivers receive all the waters flowing to the westward of the eastern coast range, and secondly, the lake system further to the westward. The great salt lakes to the north of Spencer's Gulf receiving Cooper's Creek and its many tributaries, and also the Diamantina and Herbert, their waters being dissipated by soakage and evaporation. Westward again, there is little doubt that no system exists. The level nature of the country and intermittent rainfall shortening the existence of the creeks before they have time to unite their floodwaters in one large permanent channel. The rivers of the eastern coast are the Kennedy, the Endeavour, the Barren, the Burdekin, with its many tributaries, the Clark, the Perry, the Star, the Keelbottom, the Fanning, the Sutter, which last brings down the united waters of the Cape and Beliando, and finally, after passing through the Leichhardt Range, the Bowen and the Bogey. The Fitzroy, another river of many tributaries, the Mackenzie, the Isaacs, the Nagoa, and the Dawson. Then come the Boyne, the Colan, the Burnett, which receives another Boyne, the Mary, the Brisbane, all in the colony of Queensland. On this coast in New South Wales come next the Tweed, the Richmond and the Clarence, the Maclay, the Hastings and the Hunter, the Hawkesbury, the Shoalhaven and the Clyde. The Snowy River, though rising in New South Wales, discharges itself into the sea in Victorian waters. Thence we come to the Latrobe and the many minor streams that flow into the ocean instead of into the great receiver, the Murray. The Glenelg and the Wannon, then comes the Murray, the outlet of the inland waters. Westward, the rivers of the coast become smaller and less frequent until at last they cease to exist. But on the western shore, where the coast range once more reasserts itself, we find in Western Australia the Swan, the Irwin and the Greeno. The Murchison and the Gascoigne, the Ashburton, the Fortescue, the De Grey and another Fitzroy. On the north coast, we meet with the Victoria, the Daly, the Adelaide, the Alligator, the Liverpool, the Roper, the Lemon Bight, the MacArthur, the Robinson, and the Calvert. The Albert, which is the outlet for the Nicholson and the Gregory, the Leichhardt and the Flinders, the Norman, the Gilbert, the Ainsley, the Mitchell, the Archer, the Jardine, and the Batavia, which brings us back to our starting point at Cape York. Now come the inland arteries, the streams running through the tableland and feeding the Darling and the Murray. These are the Murrumbidgee, which equals the Murray almost in importance, the Lachlan and the Darling, which brings down the waters of a hundred streams, the Macquarie, the Castlereagh and the Bogan, the Namoy and the Guida, the Dumaresque, the Condamine, the Maranoa, the Mooney and the Warrigo. And falling into the Murray itself from the south are the Ovens, the Goulburn, the Mitamita, the Campaspe and the Loddon. The other rivers of the inland slope are the Barku and Thompson, forming Cooper's Creek, the Diamantina, the Burke and the Hamilton, the Herbert or Georgina, the Air Creek. All these end in the flats and shallows of the Great Salt Lake District. The remaining watercourses to the westward cannot be classed in any way. Their course is apparently determined by local inequalities of the surface, and although some are very considerable in appearance, their flow is so brief that it is impossible to consider them as at all forming part of one system. The longest and most important is Sturt's Creek. The coast country, meaning the land watered by the rivers first enumerated, has the advantage over the tableland in the matter of rainfall, 
and the rivers therefore possess more of the characteristics of running streams than the chains of isolated ponds that are known as rivers in the inland slope. The climatic influence is especially noticeable in the indigenous grasses and herbage of the two regions. Mr George Rankin, in one of his essays on Australian subjects, The Squatting System of Australia, by Capricornus, draws an excellent picture of the reclamation and transformation of the forest primeval. Quote, The first comers in 1788 found before them, as their ships came to anchor, sandstone bluffs covered with scraggy trees and heath-like plants, with a bright blue sky above and an elastic, buoyant atmosphere around. As they went inland, they found an endless open forest, the ground being clothed with a light tufty grass, but it was the starved outline of European woodland scenery, for the trees rose bare and branchless from a thirsty soil, and the grass covered only half the surface of the earth. Except the grass, and that was thin enough, though it grew everywhere, the country seemed poor in products, and looked as if it were involved in a constant struggle between droughts and floods. They would have judged it to be poor in capability also, if, on further experience, a vitality had not appeared which seemed to electrify the soil on the touch of colonisation. Imported animals, trees and plants lived and flourished among the dingy forests, which barely yielded food enough for a few wandering savages. The farther they went, the greater contrast appeared, more drought and better country. And in later times, as the last of enigmas, a change of vegetation and climate seemed to follow the settler with his flocks and herds. After a few years feeding with stock, water has been found permanently standing in country where it never stood before. And sometimes the tufty herbage has changed into a sward. The flats that used in one season to show a succession of swamps and in another a surface of bare dusty soil rifted with yawning cracks, has often become good level turf, intersected with runnels cut by the hooves of the sheep and the cattle. End quote. The first invasion of the new territory across the range led to a terrible feeling of disappointment. True that on at once crossing the crest of the watershed country was found, which being partly within the influence of the heavier fall of rain, approached in every way the perfection dreamt of by the explorers. But as progress inland was made, a change was found to take place, and above all, the familiar indigenous grasses were lost and replaced by what the settlers took to be nothing but worthless weeds. All the now prized edible shrubs, such as the many kinds of salt bush, the cotton bush, etc., were amongst these despised plants, and even the very stock did not take to them until some years of use had rendered them familiar. These drought-resisting plants were at first supposed to be confined to the inner slope of the range, but the extended exploration of the continent shows us that where the coast range loses its character of a pronounced range and is only represented by an insignificant rise, the characteristics of the plain are continued right down to within a short distance of the sea. This is notably the case on the north, where the Flinders River and its tributaries drain country that bears all the distinctive growth of the interior. On the south coast west of the Murray, this is also the case, and in these parts, through the depression of the range, the climate is much drier. On the eastern coast, however, the distinction between the uplands and lowlands is strongly marked both in Queensland and New South Wales, even in those cases where the rivers rise in uplands approaching in elevation to the level of the tableland. The eastern coast of northern Queensland is, from its situation in the superior height of the coast range combined, the tropical garden of Australia the luxuriant growth of vegetation, taking the form of dense scrubs and jungles springing from a deep, rich soil. These scrubs of slightly varying character form a characteristic of the whole length of the eastern seaboard, and amongst them we find much valuable timber. The cedar tree is one important feature, and the Cory pine is found in one small tract in the north of Queensland. 
Further south, however, the trees grow to an enormous height in the elevated forest lands. Victoria and Western Australia are particularly noted for the giant growth of some of their trees. In Victoria, the white gum, Eucalyptus amygdalina, has been found growing to a height of over 400 feet. The red gum, Eucalyptus rostrata, and the blue gum, Eucalyptus globulus, also attain a great size in our southern colonies. In Western Australia, the jarra, Eucalyptus marginata, and the carry, Eucalyptus diversicolor, have become noted in the world as being most valuable hardwoods. Right through the continent, from east to west, the box tree, Eucalyptus maleadora, is to be found. On the tableland, the timber is altogether of a different growth. The giants of the slopes of the seaward range are replaced by low, stunted and crooked trees, some of them, however, possessing edible foliage. Most of the acacias are of this kind, the acacia pendula or mile, the brigolo, the mulga and yarren. The Caesariensae, common all over Australia under the name of the oak tree. The difference between the products of the interior upland and the coastal lowland is mainly induced by the difference of climate, those grasses and herbs growing on the tableland, while repellent in appearance and colour, compared to the richer herbage of the coast, possess qualities that render them invaluable as fodder plants. Once let, the grasses of the coast lose their moisture from drought and they become sapless and worthless. But it is not so in the tableland. Months of dry weather have no effect upon the fattening properties of the shrubs. The stock, however, have to become used to feeding on them before their full value is attained. Amongst the fauna of Australia, the distinction between coast and tableland is not so well marked, most of the well-known species ranging indifferently over the whole continent. In the kangaroos, differences in size, colour and appearance can easily be detected in widely separated localities but they do not amount to anything very noticeable to the ordinary observer. The smaller kinds, the wallaby and kangaroo rat, are common everywhere on the continent. In birds, however, the difference is great, the seeds and fruit on which some birds exist being only found in either the coastal scrubs or lowland country, whilst many of the parrots and pigeons of the interior could not live on the coast. So sharply is the line drawn in some places that on the dividing watersheds of the east coast flocks of galar parrots and plain pigeons will be found feeding on the western slope of a ridge but never by any chance crossing onto the eastern. Australia is rich in waders and they are found all over the continent. The beautiful jabiru or gigantic crane is equally at home in some lonely waterhole in the far west and at the head of a coast swamp. So too the Grus australis, or native companion, and the quaint and rich-plumaged ibis. The familiar laughing jackass is to be found everywhere, but his peculiar note differs somewhat in different parts. A black fellow from the south says that the laugh of the northern bird makes him feel sick, whilst the northern native says the same of the southern kingfisher. The great inland plains are the haunt of the flock pigeon, in countless myriads, these beautiful birds come at some seasons of the year, and in the morning when flying into the water, they look like distant clouds. The fish of the tableland differ greatly from those of the coast. In some of the inland lakes and permanent lagoons, they are so fat as to be almost uneatable, and at times so plentiful and easily caught that the black fellows scarcely trouble to get them, which is rarely the case elsewhere. The Australian native is a man with an unknown history, whether he is an improvement on his remote ancestors or a degenerate descendant, it is impossible to form any idea. Whoever they were, they left nothing behind them, except this wandering savage, and he has neither traditions nor customs that tell us anything of the past. The language is a perfect confusion of tongues and dialects, words of similar sounds and meanings are often found in places hundreds of miles apart, in distinct tribes wherein the rest of the language is altogether different. 
Their physique does not differ greatly. Perhaps in the north, an admixture of Malay blood gives a handsomer cast to the features in individual cases. But the Australian native is unmistakable wherever you meet him. North, south, east or west. The geological formation of Australia is, as is well known, very old. One third of the continent being desert sandstone with no marine fossil. But, although scantily supplied with water on the surface, there is little doubt of the immensity of the subterranean supply. Water has been struck by boring 572 feet and risen to within 10 feet of the surface, and on the Kalara Run at 144, where it rose 26 feet above the surface. Water, then, will probably be found almost anywhere at a depth of 600 feet, and a vast portion of the lightly watered plains of the interior will be worked up to their fullest capabilities by means of boring. It is generally supposed that the first portion of Australia that rose above the sea was the southeast corner, where the largest and probably the most active of our volcanoes existed. The rise of the whole continent, which subsequently took place, would have then left the interior a shallow inland sea, girt round with a broken chain of more or less active volcanoes. In time, these grew extinct, the sea evaporated, and we were left with our present coast range, with its now lifeless peaks and our depressed inland plateau, with its saline flats and lakes.' 